Hello, and welcome back to another uh, online tutorial. I am your alternative English teacher, Mr. Ushito, and in today's video, I'll be explaining uh, a poem written by, uh, composed by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, or popularly known as H.W. Longfellow. Uh, this poem is titled, The Slave's Dream. Uh, before I start, um, as usual, I want you to take out your notebook, a textbook, and a pen. So take these three things with you. Turn to page 40 on your textbook. <clears throat> and once you are there, I want you to write down the, uh, some of the important points uh, which I will, be, I will be talking about. So, first, let's uh, talk a bit about a little bit about the author, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He was an American poet who holds an important place in lit in the literature of America. He is a uh, celebrated um, uh, author in America. Uh, he was also a traveler, a linguist, and a romantic who was well versed with the traditions of Europe, European literature and thought, and more importantly, was very well versed with the American history and literature. So, uh, in this poem, <clears throat> you will find a reflection of his knowledge of um, history about the American uh, about the American history. Uh, the slave's dream discusses the true nature of slavery and freedom through its content, through the poem, and it was uh, drafted by Henry Watford, uh, sorry, Watford Longfellow. It is one of the eight anti-slavery poems in the collection, Poems on Slavery, published in December 1942. So this is not, the on, this is not his only poem on anti-slavery, but this, uh, there is a collection. And there is even um, a, a book, a collection, titled Poems on Slavery. In this collection, there are eight poems. This poem is one of them. Uh, if you wish to learn more about uh, poems on slavery, uh, you'll find that on the internet. It's readily, readily available on the internet everywhere. So uh, I would suggest you to uh, go to the internet uh, and find the remaining seven poems and read them on your own. Mm. Uh, this, in this poem, um, since the title is very clear, The Slave's Dream, we're good, uh, there will be a slave uh, and there will also be a dream. And then it's going to be the dream of the slave. Uh, it, beautifully crafted and emotionally moving, it renders a poignant image of an African king taken as a slave who dies lying in the fresh fields, remembering his motherland, his queen, and his children. Remember these points. Remembering his motherland, his queen, and his children. What were his last thoughts at the time of his death? Let's find out. Um, to, sh to shorten the time, I will not be reading out, I will not be reciting the entire poem. I will just go um, explaining uh, stanza-wise. There are eight stanzas in this poem. Um, the first stanza, beside the ungathered rice he lay, his sickle in his hand, his breast was bare, his matted hair was buried in the sand. Again, in the mist and shadow of sleep, he saw his native land. The first stanza uh, of the poem, this is the present, the present scenario of the slave. So, uh, what is the slave doing? Where is the slave? And what is his, uh, he doing at the moment? So, um, as clearly suggested in the first line, beside the ungathered rice he lay. Um, you, uh, you are already familiar with, uh, as to what a slave is, so I will not go explaining uh, the history of slavery, uh, assuming that you already know what a slave is and what a slave does. So, um, he is working in the field of his master, right? And the ungathered, the word ungathered implies that he has not uh, finished the task or the work given by his master. He had this sickle in his hand, which is a tool for farming. 
So um, his breast was bare. He had no clothes on. Um, and his matted hair was buried in the sand. His hair was uh, matted, which means it was full of dirt. And it was buried in the sand. Why is his head buried in the sand, right? Um, it is because uh, the, the slave, uh, you know, he, he stopped midway in his work and he has fallen down. Uh, he is dying. He is um, not totally, completely unconscious. He is also f uh, not fully awake. He is now somewhere in between being uh, unconscious and being uh, fully aware of, of his surroundings. So he is some, somewhere in between. And in the mist, in between the shadow and, uh, of sleep, he saw his native land. So the first line talks about the present, and this is where, uh, in the last two lines, this is where his dream starts. Um, this is not like the dream which we see during our, uh, in our sleep, <clears throat> or something which we dream of or imagine. But this is, uh, it's, it's like he, he can see his, uh, it's, a, it's more like a reflection of his, uh, past his past life. So uh, in his dream, in this dream, he sees his native land. Um, white through the landscape of his dreams, the lordly Niger float, float beneath the palm trees on the plain. Once more, a king he strode, and heard the tinkling caravans descend the mountain road. So he is now already in his dream, um, and he is now a king. Okay. He is actually a king before he was, he was actually a king before he was taken as a slave. So he's, he, it's, it's a reflection of his past. He can see uh, and he can recall the activities that he did while, uh, while he was a king in his, back in his native land. And he's reflecting on those. So he sees the uh, river Niger, which is in Africa. Um, and beneath the palm trees on the plain, once more a king, he strode. He is a king. He is riding on his horse. He is riding. Uh, he is striding majestically on his horse, and he can hear the tinkling caravans. If you don't know what a caravan is, it's like a caravan is like a, a convoy or a procession. Um, usually, you will find a caravan uh, in the desert. Right? Uh, when you when you see a caravan in the desert, there will be lots of camels with lots of people. They're uh, marching in a group going somewhere. So uh, these are the, you know, some of the things which are very normal, which you, you will see in the desert. And he is imagining, he is uh, not imagining, he is recalling his normal life. Um, in the third stanza, he saw once more his dark-eyed queen among her children stand. They clasped his neck, they kissed his cheeks, they held him by the hand. So in the third stanza, he sees his wife and children. He has, in reality, he has a wife and children back in his native land. It is just that he has been, he, he, this king has been uh, separated from his family and brought to America as a slave. Um, so he, he saw he saw his queen. He saw his children. His children clasped his neck. And they kissed his cheek, they held him by the hand. These are, uh, this, this shows the affection uh, that he shared with his um, children and his uh, family back at home. So when he sees this in his uh, dream, uh, you know, uh, a, a tear, a tear burst from the sleeper's lids, that is from the slave's lids and fell into the sand. He is um, lying down on the sand uh, his head is buried in the sand and he can and he's dreaming of these things so while dreaming of these things he sees everything that is that he has left behind in his native village he, he sees them and especially when he sees his children and his wife a tear it burst from his eyes as he was laying in the field and then at furious speed he wrote back to the dream along the niger's bank his brittle reins were golden chains, and with a martial clank, 
at each leap he could feel his scabbard of steel smiting his stalin's flank now he's riding at a very fast pace he's riding his horse uh, um, at, at a fast pace along the river niger and his bridle reins if you can see in the picture there uh, there is a man on the chariot with a horse uh, and you see the rope right that is the bridle rein okay uh, that is uh, a set of leather straps that are put around the horse's head to allow its rider to control it so the chains uh, the uh, bridle reins they were made of gold which tells us a life of luxury that this uh, king had before he was taken as a slave and with the martial clank at each leap he could feel his scabbard of steel smiting his stallion's flank so um, the king is not riding on his chariot he is riding on his horse that picture is just an example but uh, he's riding on his horse and it, he's a king right um, a soldier so he is uh, he has uh, this thing a sword and this sword as he was riding on his horse this he could feel that the sword uh, the, his sword was hitting against the <clears throat> um, the body of his horse <clears throat> before him like a blood red fleck the bright flamingos flew from noon till night he followed their flight over plains where the tamarind grew till he saw the roofs of kafri huts and the oceans on the and the ocean rose to view now this line uh, in this line he is still wandering around in his kingdom he is going from one direction to the opposite direction freely and uh, he sees he sees uh, flamingos uh, he follows their flight you know, over plains where the tamarind grew till he saw the roofs of the Kafri house. Kafri means uh, it is uh, a race inhabiting Kafiristan in Central Asia. So this African African king, you know, he is riding and he is riding till you know Central Asia, right? So uh, this tells us about um, his f the freedom that he had before he was taken as a slave. He could go anywhere he wanted um, unlike his present situation being a slave at night he heard the lion roar and the hyena scream and the river horse as he crushed the reeds beside some hidden stream and it passed like a glorious roll of drums through the triumph of his dream the forest with their mirrored tongues shouted of liberty and with a blast with the blast and the blast of the desert cried aloud with a voice so wild and free that he started in his sleep and smiled at their tempestuous glee he did not feel the driver's sweep nor the burning heat of day for death had illumined this land of sleep and his lifeless body lay a worn out fetter that his soul had broken and thrown away I have purposely read the, uh, recited the last three um, stanzas. L uh, let's look at the last stanza. He did not feel the driver's whip. That is, he did not feel his master's whip. If you know, uh, you know what a whip is, right? It's like a, uh, it's like a rope. Usually, it's usually a leather strap used for punishing, uh, beating. Uh, slaves he did not feel it the, his master is hitting him with uh, uh, this thing whip he could not feel it he could not even feel the heat of the day because he is dead he was laying there uh, in the field dreaming of these things and now he is dead uh, and his lifeless body lay a worn out fetter that his soul had broken in thrown away a uh, fetter means chains around a person's feet so his lifeless body lay there and this uh, worn out fetter this broken fetter was uh, broken and thrown away by his soul uh, which means the, the the slave finally achieved freedom at last now, the reason why I, I, I skip those two um, 
paragraph uh, stanzas, uh, six and seven is because I, um, I want to dwell, uh, talk more about slavery and freedom through this content. You are already familiar with uh, slavery. A slave has no right. Once a slave is owned by his master, he has to obey everything that his uh, master says. A slave is not paid. Um, a slave is, uh, he, he doesn't have freedom. He's not free to do anything he wants, which is uh, quite uh, contradictory to his previous life because in his previous life he was a king. and He was free to do whatever he wanted. And the entire poem talks about freedom. Starting from uh, second paragraph, uh, sorry, second stanza, till the last stanza, except for the first stanza, the remaining seven stanzas talks about freedom, which tells us that this poem is anti-slavery. And he, uh, the, in, in his entire dream, he, uh, it, it talks about freedom. He is a king. He is, um, in, the, in the first stanza, uh, in the second stanza, he's uh, riding his horse slowly, leisurely, um, um, the way he wants. Um, in the fourth stanza, we can see that he is riding at a very fast pace, which means, which tells us that he has the freedom to choose, the freedom to choose at what speed he wants to travel. Uh, <clears throat> And you know uh, the fifth stanza, where he follows the flamingos uh, from morning till night, till he reached Central Asia from Africa. That also tells us about the freedom that he had before he was taken as a slave. And the last, uh, sorry, not last, but uh, sixth and seventh stanzas, they talk about uh, you know the uh, king or the slave hearing the roar of the lion or the scream of the hyena or the cry of the river ho horse or you know, the, you know, the sh shouting of the forests, right? Um, the blast of the desert. See, this all suggests freedom, okay? This all suggests freedom. Um, they're all shouting of liberty. They're all shouting of freedom. And uh, this is because the, the king or the, uh, this person has been taken as a slave and he longs for freedom. Even in his dream, he is longing for freedom. And we can say that he was finally able to achieve freedom through death. In death, after his death, nothing could harm him, nothing could control him anymore. Even the chain that is... Um, that has been tied around his feet, around his body, it could not hold him anymore because uh, his, his soul was able to break this chain and he was finally free. That is what uh, the uh, nature of slavery and freedom talks about. Um, before I before I wind up, I, I I want you to turn to page forty three, appreciating the poem. Read the following lines from the poem: The lordly Niger flowed, the forests with their myriad tongues shouted of liberty, and the blast of the desert cried aloud with a voice so well and free. These are examples of personification. Um, you can see that in these sentences, the river is described as lordly. Only a person can be lordly, right? Uh, only a, f uh, a person can shout. And only a person can cry. These are the attributes which human, human beings have. But these attributes have been given to uh, uh, objects or non-living things. Uh, not, not, not exactly non-living, but non-human, non-human things. So, uh, non-human objects. So, like uh, the river, the forest, the desert, these are non-human, but they're all uh, doing this act. 
something which only a human can do. This is called personification. When, we, when you attribute human qualities to non-human things, to non-human uh, things. So this is called personification. This is an assignment, assignment for you to find out more instances of personification in the poem. You will find a lot of personification in the poem. I hope I was clear with personification. When you attribute human qualities to non-human beings, uh, non-human objects, it is called personification. It is also clearly explained in these lines. So um, this, will, this is part of your internal. This assignment is part of your internal. Uh, your internal carries 10 marks. Um, so please take this seriously. And after you are done uh, with this assignment, please submit it to my personal number. That is all for today. I hope you learned something. And I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.